Hello and welcome to this uh, video, which is basically uh, a rerun, a slightly shorter version of the talk that I gave at the Research Ed in London 2022. Uh, I just want to share the, the slides that I shared explaining what I was trying to say. The basic theme of the talk is that my experience working with teachers in a training scenario is that they're really busy and a lot of teachers have found it difficult to prioritize the time to read research papers, even when people have read, say, Rosenstein's Principles of Instruction, um, or they're supposed to have, when you explore it, they haven't actually really read it, they've just some, seen a summary, seen the bullet points, even though it's one of the shortest bits of uh, research summary that you could find. And it's just really unrealistic when you're doing a, a teacher development program to expect every teacher to be up to speed with what the original evidence is around the, all the different studies around their, their practice. So we need to have a better way of getting ideas across. And what I find is that it actually pays off to just focus on the core principles of what uh, the cognitive science model contains, rather than endlessly sharing new studies and getting into the detail. And once you've got a shared understanding of the model, which you refer to over and over again, you can apply it to lots of different other situations and it just gets consolidated and it's just a useful diagnostic. So when we're looking at the complexity of a classroom, I just find this really interesting to think about the challenge that a teacher has got in really effective teachers, even the, the best teachers, if you can even use a phrase meaningfully like that, find it hard in real time to be on top of all the learning challenges that they're, they're dealing with at once. And so you need good systems and routines which deal with that the best we can. And it's imperfect. It's difficult and it's imperfect. So, but if we understand the reason why students might not learn or the reason why a certain technique has a better chance of making more people think, for example, we're more likely to use that technique. Just being told to do something because you're meant to only goes so far if you understand the reason for it and have a model that you can then use to explain that to yourself. It helps you sustain habits and, uh, and it helps you make choices in real time in the lesson about which technique might be more useful because you've got this better understanding of the rationale for it. So I find looking at this concept of being evidence informed drives me to this thing of the model. There's so many things to read about and the core ideas come through over and over again. And the core ideas are located in this key model. The origin of the model is from cognitive load theory and from people like Dan Willingham's Why Don't Students Like School. Still without question, one of the very best books written for teachers about how we learn. And I'd recommend anyone to just go and read that book. But still, you know, most schools I go to where I use the slide over and over again, has anyone read Why Don't Students Like School? Most places I go, nobody has read it. Sometimes one or two people have read it. So of course you can't rely on one book, even if you evangelize about it, it's not, not re realistic, but the ideas from that book, the ideas from the research can be communicated over and over again. And it starts, uh, the origin of our diagram comes from this uh, schematic diagram that Dan Willingham uses in this brilliant chapter, Why Do Students Forget Everything I Say, which gives a very reassuring account of the human nature of forgetting and the fact that we're kind of programmed to do so. And it's not surprising when students forget things. It's entirely predictable, in fact. So if we're anticipating forgetting and we've got an understanding of the, the, the bottleneck issues and the, the memory overload issues, we've got some model to base our strategic thinking around when we're coming to teach more effectively in the classroom. So these are the sorts of things that Dan Willingham says. In my, in my talk at research, I went through them one by one, but really, they, they, you know, they're something to go and re read about more each one. Memory is the residue of thought. It's the classic Willingham phrase. And he says in the book that probably the most useful insight that has come from the whole of cognitive science for teachers is that they should think about the lessons that they deliver through the lens of 
what students will actually think about. So you've got to decide what do you want them to think about and then make sure they are thinking about it. And that's got implications for the material that you use, the resources that you use, the structure of questioning. And critically, this idea that it has to be everybody. Everybody has to be um, doing the thinking, not just some. It's got implications for understanding about understanding as a concept versus knowledge. And some people make this artificial distinction between them, whereas really understanding is just more knowledge, more interconnected. And the schema we form, the rich web of knowledge that we have, manifests itself as understanding. Uh, and that capacity to explain things in a more extended way might reveal more about what we understand in, in lots of situations. William talks about drilling, that, that overlearning, practicing things repeatedly to the point of fluency helps us to be able to recall information without as much effort, which then means we can rely on it, which frees up capacity in our working memory and so on. And yet, you know, you still find situations where drill or rote learning and those sorts of phrases are used in a pejorative sense rather than giving value to re repetition and practice in a, in a positive sense, which is what we really should be doing because it's, it's totally sensible. And then, of course, the power of stories, the, the idea that knowledge that we remember and that we house in our memories is often connected through narrative structures this leads to that and because of this that happens and if i change this that will happen happen over here story structures are often how we organize our ideas and it's useful to capitalize on that when we're teaching so there's lots to get from from dan willingham now we could add more complexity sometimes people say to me that model's simplistic i don't think it's simplistic i think it's simplified because of course when we're talking about what's in someone's long-term memory it's it's partly knowledge they've gained through learning through reading but it's also influenced by their entire life their experience of the world the, the context in which they live social emotional factors play a part and so on so your schema for an idea is unique to you because of all the different ways you've arrived at it and of course teachers need to be conscious of that we could explore more the idea of attention we could explore more to do with um, what goes on in the working memory. But the complexity we could add to the diagram doesn't mean the diagram itself is, is not useful, because it is. I find it's immensely useful to start with it. We could talk about the, the auditory loops and the visuospatial sketch pad, the idea of dual coding that adds another layer of sophistication to our model. We could talk about uh, Fiorella and, and Mayer's work on generative learning and the model, the SOI model, where you, you select, organize, and therefore integrate ideas with what you already know, and that constitutes learning. That's a useful model. But again, it's a layer which is underpinned by the same basic model. One particular development of the model I, I think is interesting to, to look at is Efrat First's uh, exploration of how we form memories and form knowledge in our in our long-term memory through rehearsing around a tight set of information which we then encode so it's sort of in our memory and then we talk about how to retrieve that information sort of get it out of our memory and then strengthen those pathways over time eventually leading to fluency and as a as a journey from that initial encoding through to the using the information and then through to fluency of re retrieving and knowing something sort of more or less permanently and it's my experience that a lot of false dawns with implementing re retrieval practice go too quickly to the retrieval mode as if we already have encoded successfully whereas a lot of the time where students are not successfully doing that is because they didn't really encode successfully so there wasn't enough short-term checking and rehearsal at that initial point of learning and an example i gave in my talk was around a student trying to learn the name of parts of a flower in a, in, and being quizzed on it, being asked what a stamen was. And it was obvious that they had never ever learned what a stamen was. It wasn't, it wasn't, let me see if I can remember stamen and practice retrieving it and strengthen that pathway. The student had never successfully said stamen in his head and linked it to what an, an anther and a filament are and, and the pollen and, and anything. It hadn't been encoded successfully. So unless something's been encoded in that initial stage, we can't then retrieve it later successfully to strengthen. There's nothing to strengthen. 
And that subtle insight about the difference between that initial rehearsal phase and the, the, the subsequent retrieval phase, I think is significant. So when we're looking at the, the diagram and we look at the phrase remembering, the word remembering, that is a basically a prompt for unpacking that in lots of situations. So we remember in multiple ways. Multi remembering has stages to it. And it also could manifest itself as practicing something that you do all the time, like playing the piano or practicing a, a physical, anything physical, remembering a phrase, remembering a fact, remembering aspects of writing, anything that uses knowledge we already gained is, is remembering. So rather than looking at that and going, isn't that a bit reductive? It's not. It's a prompt for thinking about all the things that we where we have to transfer stuff from our long term memory into our working memory where we use it. So. Let's use that diagram in that way as a platform for thinking. A key thing that comes up in the training I do is the tension and the, the attention being double arrowed here. So some attention is to do with being distracted by external stimulus and our need to focus on specific aspects of learning in order to successfully form a schema. And sometimes when we think about attention in, in lessons, we're thinking about that sort of not letting students be distracted by each other, by busy classroom walls and so on. But really, it's mainly about focusing your mental attention. And mental attention is something which you can't take for granted. You've got to create structures so that students feel that they are being directed through a learning process without too much effort. So things like tasks, which make you do things in a certain sequence, or questioning techniques, which have an accountability to them so that you're expected to give an answer, help you punch through all the competing you know, th things which you might pay attention to, to the thing which is the learning in hand. So thinking hard about how do I secure attention is really important. It, it influences so many things, the way that we organize our classrooms and the discipline we have around students thinking for themselves and so on. So they're all having to do this. So this is the key. All of this makes sense for an individual, but the real challenge of teaching is, is doing it for everybody. And it's still the, the thing which dominates the dynamics of a class is the challenge of applying what might work for one student to everybody, making everybody think, making everybody uh, evaluate their knowledge, making everybody have the opportunity to practice and rehearse. So this is the real challenge in teaching. It's not teaching somebody something, it's teaching everybody. And still, you know, we're grateful sometimes, overly grateful that somebody has learned something in our lesson, when as really our goal is to, to secure learning for everybody. And that means we've got to have tools and mechanisms which allow us to do that, to check how it's going in real time, as well as obviously assessment processes which would follow. There are lots of then things to, to, to think about. So the, the, one of the big things that we have to do to begin with is then plan the curriculum, the curriculum itself. If we think about this in terms of a schema building concept, we, we, we think, how do I build a secure schema? Here's a, just a, a stimulus, which is to do with global warming as a, just a form of curriculum content to consider. How do you get to the point where you have a really thorough understanding of why we need wind farms, which is what it says behind my head here, and what what significance they have in relation to this issue of global warming and, and the greenhouse effect and so on. There's a lot, so there's a lot of layers of knowledge and, and this, if we're not careful, we can assume students have knowledge they don't have, we can give them too much knowledge at once, and it might not all make sense. So we've got to think hard about how you organize the information so that it builds into a, a coherent set of knowledge which a student can absorb a piece by piece, make sense of for themselves, and then develop what might constitute understanding of these things through a successfully arranged schema in their head, which they can then practice using and become, say, fluent in using this knowledge. So when we apply that then to this model, this is where looking at the model in different ways I, I find helpful. Schema building is about this sort of thing on the head here. It's it's how do we set out the information to form that knowledge, which eventually will locate itself in everyone's long term memory. And sometimes it's useful to think about the reasons why students might not successfully learn. So these are some of the things they may have had attention deficits while you were explaining things. 
they may not have been able to focus their attention on the right thing because you might have presented too much at once, for example. So if, if, they, if it's not explicit what matters from all the information, there's lots of things going on in the information. The students might pick up the wrong bit and they don't realize that that was significant, that was less important and that, that type of thing. Probably the most important thing is this top one, the lack of prior knowledge. You make assumptions when you're talking about the greenhouse effect about, you know, do they even know what a greenhouse is or the gases involved, you know, what is a gas, carbon dioxide being a specific type of gas that's not the same as nitrogen and oxygen, that type of thing. You know, you, you can't just assume people know, oh, carbon dioxide, that's this. You might have to explain way more than you might want to in order for the knowledge in hand to make sense. And that is one of the key challenges I find teachers have all the time, this dilemma. We want to cover all this complex material, and yet some of the students are not with us. They're, they're, they need to go back some steps. And the truth is you can't just duck that challenge. You have to teach the students that you've got in front of you with the knowledge that they have. You can't just hope they have more knowledge than they have. They don't. If they don't have it, they don't have it. So you've got to find out what they know in order to then build the schema around what they already know so that they can make sense of, them, of things in their own head. And that's a, probably one of the most common things I see is where students are struggling, the learning that they're engaged with is, is beyond them already. And that's the thing to think about. Of course, it could be to do with re recall and fluency issues. It could be that they sort of half know things, but it's also tentative. They're not able to produce knowledge when they need it. And so that slows them down in acquiring more knowledge. A lack of fluency is very inhibiting in terms of acquiring more knowledge because you lack confidence and so on. It can be to do this thing of task completion. A lot of false starts in lessons can be where the teacher is overemphasized doing it making it look nice getting it done having it finished all that kind of stuff rather than knowing it and if we fall into that delusion too rap too often students can end up thinking the main thing i need to do in lessons is just get it done make it look like i know things get the answer written down and they're not evaluating their knowledge in, in a true sense and of course there could be just way too many things overload so all all these things are diagnostics around what's a problem. So it's true to say that cognitive science in this model doesn't necessarily give us directly the answers. It doesn't, it, it, but it really helps us understand the problems. So that's what we, we're really trying to do with this. We're trying to understand the problem that we face. Of course, then we need some solutions. We need a place to go to find solutions to the problems. Some of them come from some of this work like um, Arthur Shimamura's work on Marge model, those of you who have read it, it's a, you can Google it, it's a freely available PDF, it's a superb piece of work, I think, uh, and it's summarised with this acronym. And it, again, if you, if you, this isn't extra, this isn't different, it's a way of looking at the same set of ideas through a different set of language and concepts perhaps, but I find this really useful when you, you take a new uh, look at something. So. Shimon Mirror talks about motivate and attend again. So this idea of motivate is important. When you're trying to focus your attention on something that takes effort and we don't want to use effort we don't need to. So our brain tends to avoid making effort if it can get away with it. So if I can rely on my friend to give me an answer or if I can wait back in class till the teacher gives an answer, I will. But also it's not just that type of, of motivation. It's actually your brain might just... Um, not not even trying to make the connection with things and, and puzzle something out uh, unless you, it's got a reason to. So that it could be something as simple as asking the students, what do you think will happen next? And, and that motivates your brain to engage with that question rather than just sort of telling them the answer. This this is this and then this is this. But you're just sort of receiving. If you ask, if you ask students, what do you think will happen next? Then you are motivated by your your kind of hunger for narrative conclusion to go oh i wonder what and you're starting to activate knowledge so shimon is really good on this that the, the the nature of the attention and how you motivate your brain to secure that attention comes through things like hooks up and using things like personal engagement what do you think how do you think you'd feel in the situation what choice would you make if this was you and so on that type of thing but also the narrative hooks making predictions and seeing if they come out to be true he talks about relate, which is all about the architecture of knowledge and the way we can structure things in advance for students, organizing the curriculum material so that it's got categories which you can compare between 
any kind of hierarchical structural sort of flow to the knowledge, which you can then use as your instructional sequence, helps students form a coherent schema, and that's very useful. But perhaps most of all, it's this generate, evaluate business, where we generative learning is all about producing uh, knowledge or, 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 or doing things with knowledge you've already got. So you have to produce an answer, say something from memory, or use knowledge you have to, to, to work out a solution to something. And then you need to evaluate whether you're successful. So that's a repeated loop we go into. We generate, and then we evaluate. So did I get it right? No. Okay, why? What, where did I get it wrong? So we generate an answer, we evaluate the answer, and that gives us information about the success of our learning. If students don't have to generate and they can constantly just receive, they don't have a chance to evaluate whether they know it themselves. And there's, there's so much insight. So again, looking at Shimamura with this diagram, it overlays, it consolidates, and it's really useful. Rosenstein's principles of instruction, you know, where he gives us his nice, punchy instructional techniques that teachers should know about, informed by cognitive science, as he says. And I find it really useful to give the rationale for Rosenstein's principles, again, using the, the memory model. So if we look at that, you know all the different things pre reviewing material if i just move myself over here reviewing material questioning checking for understanding and so on all of them have a, an explanation using this memory model reviewing material clearly daily review versus weekly and monthly review and you would go and look at that in more detail the difference between them daily review is really about activating knowledge you're going to need to use today say and you're about to use it so we activate that prior knowledge whereas weekly and monthly review is about rehearsing knowledge in a sort of spaced way over time to make sure that we don't forget things that we learned before. Questioning and checking for understanding is all about eliciting evidence of knowledge and getting students to show you what they know so that you can evaluate how successful the teaching has been or the learning has been and make decisions about what to do next, as well as giving them practice knowing themselves what they know and don't know, as well as strengthening pathways. So there's lots of benefits to questioning and checking for understanding for the students and also then for the teacher. Of course, the schema building aspect of this, sequencing concepts in small steps to break through that finite working memory bottleneck, which is a real problem, but modeling things so students have got a schema forming around success that's completed and knowledge arrayed in a way which is constitutes success, like a piece of writing, and scaffolds which support the schema building uh, which then we take scaffolds down so students become more independent. But it can be really helpful to provide structure to that initially, which helps students form connections which they wouldn't otherwise be able to make. And finally, stages of practice. So practice is sort of the path to fluency, guiding that practice initially, and then reducing the guidance so students can do things independently. This is to do with forms of generative learning and remembering and evaluating that knowledge more and more independently and, and teaching students where to focus their attention on the basis of their, their own diagnosis of their success. Another set of ideas which is uh, you could overlay is Dinner Williams inside the black box um, with, with Paul Black and then his subsequent work on formative assessment strategies with uh, Siobhan and Leahy where they talk about these five um, different techniques or, or strategies really for formative assessment. Here I've added these loops because I feel like we need to explain how feedback looks. Now you can generate feedback internally. You can evaluate whether you've been successful or whether an idea sounds right. So if you form a sentence in your head and you say it in mentally, you can evaluate whether it's a good sentence without anyone else having to tell you that. You just make a choice. So you can, you can review and internally generate feedback. But most often when we're sort of so they produce an answer and then see how it compares with what might be a stated version of the correct answer in a, in a, in a, in a, on a resource. You know, did I get the answer right? Well, here's the answer. Did you get it right? I could compare. Or it might be the teacher giving us feedback. So the, the Or it could be my partner giving me feedback in a paired quizzing situation. So there's lots of ways which the, our attention is, is given to external sources of feedback, but we can also generate feedback loops internally. So the point here is that Feedback generated by the teacher, by the student himself, or by a peer are part of this, this whole structure of evaluating the knowledge in our long-term memory and deciding where to focus our attention in order to then secure uh, better learning. So it helps us uh, explain the reason why those things seem to work, I think.
Another uh, application is in the, the selection of questioning techniques. When we are eliciting evidence of learning, checking for understanding, there are generally, I find, three main different ways of doing it. There's the, the, the technique where you want to get a quick hit of what everyone can do. So you're looking at the whole class. I want to know, can everybody do this? So show me now using whiteboards. And you've got to have the discipline of that being every student doing their own, thinking for themselves. So you're getting a record of what they can do themselves. So show me boards, everyone, three, two, one, show me. Or is it, I want them all talking and rehearsing, using the language, practicing, using the terminology, hearing themselves speak uh, in the safety of a pair, pair share. I think pair share is a perfect technique for that. And then of course, sometimes we want to explore in a more deep way, the types of responses students have generated and you want it to be for everyone. So then you've got to think it could be for everybody. So cold calling is where every student thinks they could have to give an answer. So they all have to do the thinking and then you probe and prompt with that to get students to give you more sophisticated answers. And it's the blend of these techniques. You can't succeed teaching just one of them. You can't just do only pair share or only show me boards or only cold calling. But together, they're a really punchy sort of set of ideas. And all of them reinforce this idea of everybody having to think, everyone having to evaluate their knowledge, everyone practicing. And that's where the learning model reinforces everyday classroom practice. So when you're doing a cold calling or think pair share training, give the reason, talk about it. This is a useful little activity. Look at the diagram and say, how does this explain uh, why, why we need to do it? So if you're not cold calling, how do you know everybody's thinking? Is it okay for some children not to do the thinking? Well, no, otherwise they're not going to learn. How do you get everyone to practice using words? Well, pair share can be great. You get them to include those words in their answer, ready to share them. So thinking through all of these things, how do I get everyone thinking? How do I get everyone focusing their attention? How do I get everyone remembering and practicing? These are the techniques which succeed in doing that. What about collaboration and group work? What are the risks? Well, the risks are that unless I have structure to those things, some of the students are doing the thinking, some of the students are doing the practicing, and some aren't. And I and I you know say this because I've still seen it. You do see the odd lesson where children are on bubble writing duty on a poster project, which four people are doing at once, two people are doing the thinking, and two people are just sort of admin assistants on a, on a task, and they're not really thinking. They don't have to. And that's not okay. So if you want to have successful collaboration, it's got to be such that everyone has to think, everyone has to focus their attention on the meaning of the concepts, and everyone can practice using the language. That needs thought, that needs structure. And it's probably, you're gonna do it much less often because it's hard to do well. And you do need to, to, to privilege individual work and individual thinking, because that's the most likely way most students will learn. And that's, that needs thinking. Where group work can work is if it helps with the working memory. So if you've got students, for example, can quiz each other or to do things where they you can arrange information and you can support each other through shared tools and resources where other people's learning then becomes a platform for yours. So there are tasks you can do where collaboration actually is beneficial, but we need to, again, be very deliberate and intentional around that. This is a challenge, creativity. So how does this working model work for creativity? Well, here I feel like it's important to understand what creativity is. It's about decisions. Creativity is about choices. It's about making a choice in the direction of what might be considered a creative outcome that's successful. So an art composition, a piece of music, a, a sentence and a paragraph and a story, whatever the piece of writing is. So you make a choice and you evaluate that choice. And the whole while you're forming a schema for what success looks like in that area relative to all the different other stimulus you might have had. And it makes sense that, again, everyone has to be able to do that. If you're can you teach people to be more creative? Well, you can. But you've got to then be allowing them to make choices, allowing them to teach them to evaluate the outcomes, comparing the schema they have for success with other models and rehearsing certain techniques so they're able to use them fluently so they can be more creative with them. So the more you know, the more creative you can be. So that's got implications for knowledge, knowledge in music, knowledge in art, knowledge in science, knowledge in maths, knowledge in writing, knowledge in vocabulary becomes a tool in your creative process. So understanding how creativity arises through thinking about it in relation to the model, I think is useful. 
I didn't actually get to do this section in the talk because I'd run out of time by now. So there we go. That's my sense of what being evidence informed means. It's understanding how we learn. And it doesn't mean you have to have even read any of the original papers. I don't think if there's somebody key in the school who can deliver the summaries and just get people thinking about the model and about how it applies, I think sometimes that just that is enough so that then we can then explain the, the actual methods and techniques from that. It's a, just a bit of a, of a closing thing though. This, you know, the model is, is always evolving. It's not fixed, it's not static. It's summarized in this form, a bit like you can represent the atom in different levels of sophistication. We don't need every single detailed nuanced thing about the memory model to be true and, and resonant in every moment. But we have to develop our understanding from a basic model into a more and more sophisticated model. And that's happening over time. So it's always useful to remember the wisdom of someone like Carlo Rovelli, who's work applies to physics, but I think what he says applies also to educational research, that if we're open to that model changing and we're evaluating it constantly, this is why we, we can rely on it. And it's not because it's absolute, it's because it's not absolute, it's because we're constantly open to it and we're trying to constantly test it out. And as teachers, we, we're not in a position of researching the, the cognitive science directly, but we are in a position of testing it out uh, and seeing if it makes sense in, in, in the cauldron of the classroom. And that's the kind of part of the processes I feel. So there we go, I hope you found that useful. A summary, but also I sort of managed to get slightly more in than I managed in the talk because it's slightly easy to do remotely, but I hope you found that useful. And uh, there's plenty more to read on my blog and so on about it and in the walkthroughs. So thank you for listening and I hope you found that useful.